everybody here we are for episode 84 of now showing with mike and wayne uh this year for celebrities uh passing away has been a big one already um we're not even a full two months in this last week uh we lost i wouldn't say he's one of my favorite directors but he's a man who's influenced my life in a lot of ways uh because he was the director of ghostbusters and that is ivan reitman um, everybody, I think, knows his son, Jason Reitman. His daughter, Catherine Reitman, also is a writer, producer, actor. And she works on um, the TV show Working Moms on Netflix. And uh, I believe it's uh, in Canada as well, because that's where the show originated. Really good show if you haven't ch- uh, checked that one out. So we figured we'd talk a little bit about Ivan Reitman uh, before getting to our movies that we reviewed this week. Um, just looking at his, his director uh, list here. Uh, I tried to find Cannibal Girls because I was going to see if I could watch that for today, but I couldn't find it because, of course, it sounds like something right up my alley. Um, that's something he did, I think, with like um, Roger um, Corman, I believe, or something like that. One of those type of just B movies back in the day. Uh, but his first big movie or movie that made it big was Meatballs in 1979. Not only did it introduce the world to uh, Ivan Reitman, but it introduced the world to Bill Murray. As that was, I should say, introduced the world because he had been on SNL already for about a year at that point. Um, but it, Bill Murray, the movie star, I'll, I'll say that. It introduced us to him as a movie star. And uh, Meatballs was one of those just kind of summer camp movies um, that were real popular in the 70s and 80s. Not as much in the 90s as they kind of died down. But, um, Wayne, what are your memories of meatballs? I love them in a sandwich. Uh, <laughs> spaghetti. Meatball subs are fantastic. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, what are you talking... How do you really... You know, it, it, was, it was a thing. You know, it was funny. You know, <laughs> Bill Murray. Like, you know, was sarcastic, sardonic. You know, anti-hero as always. Yeah. I I think it's definitely a movie you could say that if Bill Murray wasn't in it, it probably would have been pretty terrible. Yeah. Uh, but he definitely saves it and makes it worth watching. Uh, it was one of those things that I, you know, when I worked at Blockbuster and I talked about movies with the people I worked with, someone brought up Meatballs. Like, oh, you haven't seen Meatballs? And I was like, no, I was not alive when Meatballs came out. And it wasn't like this huge, huge movie or anything. So I ended up buying the DVD uh, the special edition DVD and watching. And I, I liked it. That was a, is a fun movie. And Bill Murray was the big, my biggest takeaway um, out of it. It is definitely like an indie comedy film though. Is it, it very low budget, you know, and they didn't really have indie back in the day, but studios would give, you know, very minimal money to up and coming directors to do these camp movies. We reviewed one not too long ago. Uh, I forget the names uh, escaping me at the moment, but uh, it was one of those other 80s summer camp films. Um, So they're out there. There's a lot of them out there. I think this one maybe kind of started the trend and, you know, it did spawn, I think four, uh, three other movies, because I believe there's four of them, one of which has Corey Feldman in it. Um, I believe that's you've got the the summer camp comedies. You also have the summer camp slashers. So right, exactly. So this is right at that time, nineteen seventy nine. This is right when all this, all that culminated into basically its own kind of subgenres. Um, so it's interesting. Just kind of he was on the the uh, the beginning of that, the tip of that. Uh, it's not it's not a great movie, I don't think, but it is something if you if you're interested in where Ivan Reitman and Bill Murray started, it's definitely something to go back and watch. Definitely got the nostalgia factor. It does. And what we were talking about as we were prepping for this week, uh, the number of films Ivan directed versus what he was attached to as an executive producer or producer. Wow. It's like tip the scales. I think on IMDb here, he's only credited with directing 23 films. Whereas you go through as executive producer and producer, it's like, wow. Yeah. He was part of a lot of big, wow. <laughs> big movies, big comedies uh, back in the day. And even currently with, his, you know, producing most of his son's work and stuff. Um, so 1981, I think was where he kind of hit big and his career basically took off. And that was, we've talked about this movie before and that was Stripes. Army training. Stripes is one of those movies that uh, it's just, it's hilarious from start to finish. 
uh, having both Bill Murray and um, Harold Ramis in the lead roles was fantastic. They were both work really well together. Um, John Candy, just, there was another one too that had that great cast. Uh, a, a great cast: John Candy, uh, War Note, PJ Souls, Sean Young, John Larquette, uh, John Dahl. Let's see, Lance Galt. I know uh, Judge Reinhold. That's who I was looking for. I know Judge Reinhold was in it. Uh, so just a great supporting cast. It's hilarious. Everybody brought it in this movie. Um, it, it was kind of like the beginning of a lot of like comedy stars uh, thing essentially. And, you know, Reitman was right there to, to guide them, if you will, into, um, comedy stardom and, uh, make sure that they're, you know, working with these guys, a lot of these guys later on in their, in his career and their career as well. So, um, just the influence, when you go back and you look at the movies he's produced and the movies he's directed, the influence that he's had on cinema is huge, even though it seems like maybe he doesn't get a lot of credit for that. But I think he was there through a lot of this. And Stripes is just another good example of something that maybe a lot of people didn't know that he directed it. Maybe people just knew it as a Harold Ramis movie starring Bill Murray uh, because Ramis did write it with a couple other people. Um, But Ivan definitely became, I think, like their their third guy that they would work with or fourth guy, whatever, if you want to include Aykroyd in the mix, that they worked with a lot. Um, So anything from Stripes particular you want to you want that sticks out to you that you always like to talk about obviously the mud wrestling scene hmm. not just for the graphic tna but just yes. the fact that john candy was just exceptionally hilarious in that that scene obviously throughout the whole movie they both are but that one always sticks out with just the the raunchy debauchery and just i don't know like the ugh factor as well yes oh yeah well and i think you know um john candy's such a force in that movie Cause you kind of really, for, for someone like me, it's kind of, even though I I knew who he was by the time I watched stripes, it was to me, it was like going back and rewatching his introduction into the, the world of, of film, even though it wasn't his first movie, but just for me, that's what it felt like. Like, Oh wow. I'm seeing an early work from a person that I really had a lot of uh, love for as a fan. Um, So it was really cool going back and watching that movie for the first time. Um, having remembering those, you know, those feelings like, oh wow, this is really cool to see him and like Judge Reinhold in these in these early films. Since I had learned, or, you know, known them from other films that they did after that one. Um, it yeah, it really it's even though I saw it when I was older, it's still stu- it's a movie that has stuck with me and it's I would consider one of the best comedies ever made in my opinion. Um, not only because of my love of Bill Murray, but just because it's really fucking hilarious. So uh, we're we're not going to go huge into this one because we've talked about this movie. So we had an entire uh, episode on this on this movie. Um, in 1984, obviously he directed Ghostbusters, and never heard of it. Never heard of it. Yeah, it's his little indie film. Um, it'll catch on one day. It's uh, just is one of those. It's you know I've talked about this before. It it's a movie that sculpt who i am to this day essentially it's my what the one movie i when someone says what's your favorite movie i say ghostbusters i don't try to dig for some weird art house movie or some you know or one of the classics you know it's ghostbusters it's got comedy it's got horror it's got tension it's got great music uh the cast is just phenomenal from top to bottom it's a to me it's a perfect movie and i I just, you know, and I, like I said, I get that people are going to go, oh, really? Like, that, whatever. Like, it gives me so much joy to watch that movie. And so I owe a lot of that to Ivan Reitman and the guys. And so it, when Ivan Reitman passed away, it did definitely hit, like, a little harder than, you know, than some of these other uh, celebrities that passed away recently just because he is such a huge part of my childhood and, and of who I became, I think. I mean, I, I kind of owe that to him in a sense. I don't want to make this like super dramatic or anything, but like, you know, I talked during when we did the Ghostbusters podcast and how like I, maybe I just, my, my own personality is kind of modeled after Bill Murray in general. So Ghostbusters was the start of that for me uh, because it was the first movie that I really saw Bill Murray in and became such a huge, huge fan of his and the rest of the guys. And 
uh, just owe a lot of that to Ivan, I think, for for creating, helping create that movie and, and those visuals uh, to be a long lasting thing to kids like us, Wayne. Uh, all he will forever people. be the uh, voice of Slimer. Yes. <laughs> Uncredited side note that most people don't know. Modeled after John Belushi. Uh, right when that he fits. Huh? <laughs> that fits. Yes, and that that was, and I think people realized uh, that was more a little more well known. I actually didn't know the Ivan Reitman that he did the the voice for that. That's really cool. See, you learn something new every day, folks. So Ghostbusters. He was also the vo- he was also the voice of Zool. No shit. Excuse oh, was me. he? Yeah. That's pretty cool. He should have, even though I love who did it in the new one. He should have done it for the new one too. Yeah. Um. All right, so I haven't. I've heard of this movie, Wayne. I haven't seen it. Have you seen Legal Eagles? No, I have not. All right, so we're, we'll we'll skip over that one. But it does have Robert Redford and Deborah Winger um, and Daryl Hannah, Brian Dennehy. So I mean, I'll have to catch that one. It's got a really good cast. Uh, in 1988, he did this a little known movie called Twins, starring. Uh, Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger as the most odd couple of twins. And they are uh, complete opposites. You know, Arnold's like a cop who is very much by the book and Danny DeVito's a, a con man. So all he really sees when he meets his brother is that like he can, con- you know, like I think at first he doesn't believe him. Right, Wayne? Yeah. And like then they believe there's a lot of like, come on, get out of here. Yeah. Uh, terrible Arnold impression. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, there's a lot of, I mean, he, so he tries to kind of him, I believe too. It's been a while since I've seen this one, um, but it's pretty good. It's a funny movie. I think um, it's not one of my favorites personally. I know a lot of people really like it. I've only probably seen it a couple of times, but I did enjoy it. So it's another one that you, uh, you, you could watch if you haven't seen it. Wayne, what are your thoughts on twins? I am completely blanking on this. So now I'm like, I'm trying, now that you mentioned it, I'm like, wait, this is something I'm going to have to revisit because I'm, I'm drawing a complete blank. I, so we, we fail you on this one, uh, Interpen. <laughs> um, of course, then he did the underrated classic Ghostbusters too. I don't care what anyone says. It's a phenomenal movie. Um, you know, who, I have yet to meet a person that actually doesn't like Ghostbusters too. Manheim. So see, you met him. <sighs> How? What? How? Why? What's wrong with it? He hates joy. The answer is not a damn thing. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, if you're listening. <laughs> you know, it, critically, it didn't do very well. But it, I just watched it again recently, and I laughed almost just as much as I did the first time I watched this movie. It's still hilarious. It sure, it's not as good as the original. The, when are they? Uh, very rare. We're not gonna. We can do a whole episode on that. We probably will, but. In this case, this movie is not as good as the first movie, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, the Even the cheesiness with the Statue of Liberty, I really love that part just because Bill Murray gets so into it. Um, How can you not get into Jackie Wilson? Come on, man. Yes, and I, I think a lot of it, for me, is that the actors buy into it. You know, they're not they're not like, oh, God, we're stuck in this god-awful sequel. They're playing it the same way they play the first movie. And that's what Viggy, makes Viggy, work. Viggy, you've been a bad monkey. <laughs> And Vigo the Carpathian, I mean, come on. How could you uh how could you not like that as a villain? He was pretty fantastic. Especially the fact that I believe it was Max von Sydow who does the voice of him, too. Mm-hmm. Just like Again, our friend that we used to work with at Fell, Joshua the Carpathian. Yes, yes. He, that's what we would he, never, call him. he didn't really appreciate that nickname, but no, well, because well, I think at first he was confused because he didn't know that's what it was. Because <laughs> he was so young. He was only born like 15 years after the movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all right so the very next year after ghostbusters 2 this is another movie that i i think um i probably like more than than people should like but it's only because i watched it a million times and that's kindergarten cop uh this was a movie that ability is strong still to this day it the last time i watched it it was still really funny uh you know, is it a bad movie? Maybe, but it, it's really fun. It's hilarious. I think um, the the characters are done really well. Arnold is really charming as the when he's the substitute teacher with the kids. He's got a good rapport with those kids. Um, and obviously, you have uh, I think it's Miko 
Nico Hughes, who plays the uh, boys. Boys have penises and girls have vaginas. Uh, he, I think that's him. I'm trying to find him. Uh, I can't find him, so we'll just say it's him, even if it's not him. Uh, but he was, you know, he was funny. I think a lot of people remember him. Um, Gotta love Linda Hunt as the principal. Oh yeah, fantastic. Um, and also his partner too, uh, played by Pamela Reed. She's really good. Penelope Ann Miller, of course, is fantastic. Mm-hmm. It's uh, so much fun to hate Richard Tyson. Oh yeah, he's so good. He's so good. I was just going to say Richard Tyson is really good in that. Um, and who plays it? Carol Baker plays his mother. She's really good. Kathy Moriarty plays uh, one of the abused kid's mom. She's really good in it. Um, I, just, really, I like how the uh, the cousin brothers play Dominic. Little play on. Oh yeah, yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> Lame. <laughs> that will be the lamest joke I tell today, folks. Probably, maybe, but, but don't bet on it. Muko Hughes, there he is. I scrolled all the way down just to find him. He was in uh, Pet Cemetery. Uh, you know, Kindergarten Cop's great too because it plays not only as a comedy but as an action comedy. Uh, which were, those were very popular back in the day, you know, think something like Beverly Hills cop, but he's got to protect a child, you know? So mm-hmm. it, it was a lot of fun. I think, um, and like you said, Wayne, the rewatchability on it still holds up. It, it's a silly movie, but it's really good. And it's one of Arnold's, I think better comedies for sure. You could, I definitely felt that he stretched his abilities in a good way, in a positive yes. way in this yep. film. It wasn't too much for him. Um, all right, so then in '93 we get Dave uh, with Dave Kevin Klein as as the president of the United States and Dave, uh, also starring Sigourney Weaver. Uh, this movie is another one. This is one I used to watch all the time, and back in the in the '90s it was on TV all the time, and I really liked this one too. I thought Kevin Klein was really funny in it, um, in both roles uh, as the serious president, and then as Dave is kind of like the, the hipster hippie version of the president. Cause it's, uh, he look, he's an identical, uh, comparison to the president of the United States. So that's why he, uh, when the president, the president, does the president, he dies eventually, doesn't he? He gets sick. And then at some point he dies, I believe. I don't remember exactly. And then, uh, but Dave becomes the president and has to pretend to be married to Sigourney Weaver, who's the first lady. And they end up like kind of forming a relationship. And um, so it was a definitely, a, a, I think maybe more of a forgotten film, maybe a little bit, Wayne, have you seen this one? If I have, it's been a very, very long time. Cause again, having trouble recalling a lot. Yeah. About it. <laughs> well, maybe you shouldn't take acid before we do the show. Just a thought. Well, I'm still hungover. <laughs> As technically, I'm not because I'm still drinking. <laughs> um, so it, I recommend seeing Dave. If you haven't seen Dave, definitely check it out. I think it's really funny. I think you should watch it, Wayne. I think you'd like it. Uh, his next one was Junior. Oh, and my God. The controversy. Yes. The, the man getting pregnant. Um you know, I haven't seen this movie since I was a kid, so I, I can't say whether it holds up. I honestly don't really remember liking it much when I was younger. Um, it was just weird, and the 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 comedy. I don't know. It was it was odd. It was an odd movie from an odd time. Um, I just re- remember everybody freaking out about. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, whole, uh, the downfall of society and. Then I was like, I wonder if he's pregnant with twins. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, it is Arnold and Danny DeVito again reuniting. Um, they are mm-hmm. supposed to re- be reuniting for, I believe, triplets is what it's going to be called, um, with Tracy Morgan playing the third twi- uh, third the triplet. Nice, um, but you know, you got Frank Langella again. You got Pamela Reed again. You know, you got again. You get the recurring casts, which you know, as yeah. we talked about in the past, I love. When we talk Sandler, he does that, and a bunch of other guys. Yes, just, exactly. You know what kind of movie to, you're getting. You know what performances to expect. So going into it, it's like, all right, it's going to be good. You know, that would it would be an interesting rewatch. I would like to maybe watch that one again just to see if it if there is any quality to it because I don't remember it being very good. But um, another looks like it could be. Let's see, is it playing anywhere? Uh, looks like you'd have to rent it from. 
Amazon. That's the only way to watch it right uh, now. Okay. Well, maybe I'll do that. Probably. I'll not. put it on the list, but yeah, well, yeah. it's down there. <laughs> yeah. 97, we get Father's Day, which I think is a movie I actually really liked when I saw. I haven't seen it in probably 20 plus years. But I think for me, it was just the fact that Robin Williams and Billy Crystal were in a movie together. And I was a huge fan of theirs back in the day. Is it a good movie? Probably not. But I, I liked it. Uh, my memory of it is still that I enjoyed it. I'd have to watch it again to really remember, Wayne. Uh, what What are your thoughts on Father's Day? Uh, knowing how close Billy Crystal and Robin Williams were, I was kind of hoping it would have been better. Yeah. But I don't know if it was just the script or what the situation was. Uh, it just kind of left me feeling meh. Okay. I mean, you know, it's not horrible or anything. I just, with two names like this, you expect hilarity. And it just kind of didn't deliver on the areas I was hoping it would, I guess. Yeah, you you really expect like a laugh a minute with those two. And while there are some funny moments, there, it wasn't as good as, um, as people were expecting. Like I said, I enjoyed it, but it was, you know, 20 some years ago when it came out. So I have to watch it again to really see if it was any good or if it was just my... Um, they're still growing, I guess. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, six days and seven nights. Or six days, seven nights. Uh, the less said about that one, the better. Harrison Ford and Haish. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that one, Wade? Nope. I do uh, not. <laughs> That's how I felt about that one, too. Yeah. Um, so the next one is one I actually just watched this week, and it's kind of gave me the idea to let's talk about Ivan Reitman a little bit, and that is Evolution from 2001. Uh, starring David Duchovny, Orlando Jones, Julianne Moore, and um, Stifler. I'm trying Sean William Scott, that guy. Um, it is one of those movies that I think was underrated at the time. I saw it in theaters. I really, I really, really liked this film a lot um, when it came out, and I was kind of disappointed that nobody else did. And I just watched it again, and I still really liked it. I laughed a lot again. Um, it. It was one of those, it, it's a lot like Ghostbusters, but more in the alien section of, of uh, science fiction area. And there, it's funny because there are moments in this way that like doors opening and stuff and the same shots. I'm like, oh, that's just like Ghostbusters. I'm like, oh, that was just like Ghostbusters. So I think he knew that it was like his next kind of like Ghostbusters type movie. So he tried to, to structure some of the shots the same, some of the effects, the characters, the, the score. Uh, the score is very Ghostbusters like. Um, I really like this movie, so I want to throw more love onto Evolution. If people haven't seen it, I really recommend you going out there. I think the only way to get it is to rent it or purchase. The power it. of dandruff shampoo, sir. Yes. <laughs> See, and it's stuff like that's a total like kind of Ghostbusters type of thing, and I really liked. Um, all, I really enjoyed all the characters. Again, just watching Ethan Suppley, I forgot he was in it. Uh, there was, um, who was one of the other, there was another character too, another actor. Oh, uh, uh, John Cho was one of their students that he, he's very much not like represented very well. He's just kind of with the group. Uh, but it was like, oh yeah, there's John Cho. So it's definitely one of those movies that, is it perfect? No. Um, but if you're going to rip off Ghostbusters, you might as well be the guy that created Ghostbusters. So I think with that, I thought I think it definitely uh, is very entertaining for me. Wayne, what are your thoughts on evolution, or do you remember evolution? Oh, I do. I watched it within the last year or two. You know, corny, but definitely had that sci-fi horror comedy thing going, and uh, kind of wish more people would have enjoyed it as much as we have. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's kind of like when you bring it up, people, people either give you the blank stare, they give you the eye roll. It's like, really? Come on. <laughs> but hey. Agreed. Uh, it, it definitely deserves more love, I think. And hopefully maybe in his passing, it will be more viewed. Um, so his last three that he did, not very well received critically. Uh, my super ex-girlfriend, which I never saw, Wayne, you saw, and... You know... Um, I think again, it misses the mark for most people or, you know, they, you know, it's superhero, uh, oriented, obviously, but you know, like the, that's the whole crazed ex-girlfriend superhero thing where, uh, what's her name? 
godly Uma, uh, Uma Thurman. Uma Thurman, you, you know, does you know, you know, super sexy, all that stuff, and she plays like the psycho girlfriend, you know, to a T. It's just I don't know if Luke Wilson was the right casting choice for this because. I don't want to bash the guy. I just he's just kind of like, you know, eh. He needs the right role. Yeah. So if like, it's, a, if know, it's old a school, role, perfect for him. Yes. But old school Royal Tenenbaums. If it's something that he has to, um, like emote a lot for, he's not very good at that. He's very good at pay, basically playing like characters that are kind of. I don't, and I don't want this to sound negative, but one note to a sense. Um, mm-hmm. but usually when he plays them like in Royal Tenenbaums, like the being one note, like that's the character's strength. So like it works really well in that type of movie where playing that like as the kind of laid back because everything he plays is laid back because that's how he is. Laid laid back boyfriend, like I could see I could see it not working. I haven't seen it, but I could see it not working. I always p- kind of pictured John Cusack as a better Yeah. He could do that. So choice for this. And granted, he's not, you know, known for his great ranges of emotions, but he could play the frustrated or the angry. I don't know. I just he's played that role many times. This to sound like I'm bashing Luke Wilson at all, because you know, I respect the man and the work that he's done. It's just Come at us, Luke Wilson. Come at us. We'll take you on. No, we won't. I'm just kidding, Luke. We love you here on the podcast. Don't sue. We have to quote Rocky Five. Sue me for what? (laughs) Basically. (laughs) Um, All right. So then he took a break for five years and came back with no strings attached with Natalie Portman and Ashton Kutcher. Um, It's bad, but it's not unwatchable. I, you know, we watch a lot of rom coms on this podcast. I watched it mainly because of that, and it's an R rated kind of rom com. There's some decent moments in it. It's not a great movie by any stretch, but you could watch it and I think enjoy yourself while you're watching it and then just be like, oh. This is just like the Justin Timberlake, Mila Kunis one. Exactly, um, yep. Same right. premise. Kind of fits, right, yeah. Yes. That one that they did was just more, was better executed. Yes, agreed. Um, I think the thing that bothered me the most that I didn't really understand was Natalie Portman's kind of distant, uh, affection, ew, type thing. Whereas, you know, in the yeah. other movie that we're talking about, it's just kind of like figuring stuff out. Yeah, so. yeah. It's uh, maybe so. You're thinking maybe it was a bit more too like dramatic for a movie like this. In a sense, I haven't just seen for it. me. I didn't really understand what her problem was. Okay, and that's nothing to but say. Not or maybe it was just me missing the point. Okay, so. And I believe, believe me, I, I I love Natalie Portman. Yes, I think she's fantastic. I've always, she was one of my first celebrity crushes. Obviously, she was in Star Wars, even though she was in the you know less appealing ones. Yes, until the latest three. And I'm not going to stop. I'm going to stop right there because here's the tangent. Wayne's running down it. You know, we could we could talk about Star the new Wars. Star Wars movies are bad. We could talk about new uh, Star Wars actors without bringing up Star Wars. Wayne, it's possible. One day we'll get. No, there. we can't. <laughs> All right. So then, his last one that he directed, I think Wayne and I have an a, 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 an affinity for this film, a likeness, if you will. Um, while both knowing, I think we can we can both acknowledge that it's not a very good movie, but we like it. We like watching it. It's called Draft Day. Yes. It stars Kevin Costner, uh, the late Chadwick Boseman, uh, Jennifer Gardner, Frank Langella again, uh, Chris Berman, of course, from ESPN, um, Chi McBride, John Gruden, Deion Sanders. It is a movie about the NFL draft, essentially. It was trying to, I think, be Moneyball, but it is not Moneyball. It's more of a fantasized version of how the NFL draft could work and how a team could turn around it in just one draft. Um, it's a very complicated film, and it's, I don't want to call it poorly executed, but they try to mix in the ro- like the romantic comedy, they're not comedy, but the romantic There's a situations, lot yeah. and some family trauma stuff in there, and I just don't think 
Uh, they tried to. It almost felt like it was shoehorned in in places, and yeah. it just needed more time to breathe, in my opinion. That saying, um, I love the whole anticipation and stress that these guys are under, uh, even as unrealistic as it probably was, or it definitely is. Was whatever. It's still fun. It's 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 you know. I think with with most of our friends and stuff that didn't like it, it's because we're all so much into football. So we know how it works. We watch the draft every year. We understand that it's not this dramatic usually. And it's not realistic. You know, the fact that you would uh, make a trade for the first overall pick and give up your entire draft class and then somehow force them basically by the end of the movie to trade you everything that you traded back to them is a ridiculous sentiment. And, um, but in the concept of the film, it works. It adds the right amount of tension and makes you on the edge of your seat if you don't know anything about sports. <laughs> like, that's what the like, kind of the caveat is. It's like, it's a sports movie, which obviously means it's made for sports people, but it's really made for a lot of people that maybe don't know how it actually works behind the scenes and that most of this uh, wouldn't happen the way that it happened. And, uh, but like I said, I, I enjoy watching this movie. I really, uh, got a kick out of it. Um, I, I think Chadwick Boseman is actually really good in this film. Um, we do also get to see Arian Foster play a, a different character. Uh, Terry Crews plays that character's father. He's like, kind of like a star, uh, older star running back. Um, and his son's, you know, going to the NFL and stuff. Um, yeah. So I'm going to say, watch this movie. You could usually find it, uh, for free somewhere, whether it be Netflix or IMDb or uh, somewhere like that. It it's entertaining. It's not, I won't say it's a good movie, uh, but it's entertaining. And if you, the less you know about football, the more you'll probably enjoy it. Cause there is that romance element between him and Jennifer Gardner, uh, the whole family thing between him and his mom and his dead father and his ex wife, which is just weird to begin with. Um, it, it has, I think, everyone is giving good performances, I think. It's just that the kind of the script and the story, again, if you know a lot about football, is very unbelievable. Um, and the fact that the NFL was behind it, too, I think kind of rubbed people the wrong way. Like, how could you be behind this movie and then not make it, like, believable? Um, but, yeah, that's, I think the Moneyball was a hit, and that's what they were like, hey, let's do our version of Moneyball. And it just did not have the same – effect they didn't base it on a true story which moneyball is a true story uh moneyball is one of my favorite like sports dramas of all time so probably my number one and this is this ain't no moneyball but it is an entertaining film um and if you could put a lot of the ridiculous aside i think you can enjoy it so there's my ramblings of it so uh ivan reitman uh you will be missed rest in peace uh we're two big fans over here uh you know Gonna miss you. That's really all I got. And Wayne, anything else you want to add? Just thanks for the childhood memories. Exactly. Thanks for the memories. Perfect way to end it. All right. So we're moving on to our next segment. Our reviews of the week. <laughs> I'm loving this change up every week. All right. So we are going to start with uh, the ninth film in a franchise. Number nine, everybody. Um, it's a lot of mixed reviews out there for this one. I may surprise a lot of people with my opinion. Probably not. I'm sure you buy it. I'll figure it out what I would think of this movie. Um, all right. So I, of course, of talking of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is not to be confused with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the 1974 or the 2003 version. This is what is now considered a direct sequel to the original, even though the director has said that he does believe you could still fit the other sequels uh, into this film. Before we get into this discussion, I did want to kind of run down the franchise real quick because it, it goes all over the place. So the Texas Chainsaw, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 1974, Toby Hooper, uh, great kind of low budget horror film, not as uh, bloody and, and, uh, Dirty as people remember. If you rewatch it, watch it. The cinematography is beautiful in this in the original film for a small budget horror film from 1974. Uh, there's not really that much blood in it. It's more the idea of blood 
and the idea of what uh, Leatherface is doing to these people. He's not really, uh, you don't really get to see a lot of gore, which would the, I'll admit the first time I watched the movie, I was a little disappointed because I was like expecting it to be so disturbing. And while it is disturbing, I, I now appreciate it much more as I got older. Um, Are you trying to say there will be blood? There will be blood, yes. Just, and if you <laughs> want blood, there will be blood um, because there's a lot of blood in the sequels. Uh, the second one is a crazy comedy version of of the first movie. It's a sequel, direct sequel, where Dennis Hopper plays the brother of Sally Hardesty and um, the uh, I forget the gentleman's name, but the handicapped gentleman that gets gets murdered in the uh, uh, first film. And then, uh, so that one's just crazy. Uh, Caroline Williams plays the the final girl in that one, and she screams a lot. It's a really good, entertaining B horror film, which is funny because everyone had such high regard for the first movie, but Toby Hooper was like, "Fuck that! I'm making a different movie," and he did. Uh, so I give him a lot of credit for that because he sold it to Canon Films as, "Oh, you want to see a sequel to this amazing dark horror film? I got you." And they just gave him all the the all the credit, and they're like, "All right, sir, you're going to make us just an exact replica of Texas Chainsaw Massacre." And he's like, "Nope, not going to happen." Um, <laughs> so I I really respect him for that, and I, I think that's a really a badass way to kind of get your movie made. Uh, so then uh, Warner Brothers slash New Line's first for forte into the franchise came in 1990, I think, with. Um, the hell is it called it's uh like leather face something or other family family port uh, some it's okay it's the third one you look it up uh stars vigo mortensen that was an interesting part of it it's okay it's not great uh but some good blood and guts and stuff and leather face is pretty cool in it then you get the just crazy gonzo off the wall 1994 released i think shot a couple years prior to that Matthew McConaughey, Renee Zellweger, uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the next generation. And McConaughey, I talked about this movie recently because I just watched it again recently. McConaughey go, is fucking crazy in this movie. Uh, if anything, you need to watch it just for his performance because he really goes for it. And what it is, I'm not quite sure of, but he went for it. Um, I do recommend this movie just because of how crazy and fucked up it is and just it's not a good movie, but it's a weird movie to watch and be like, wow, these two Oscar winners made this movie before they were famous. Weird. Um, then you get the remake, which we've talked about Wayne. And I think we both are huge fans of the 2003 remake. A lot of people consider it a better film. I, over the years, I used to think that I now think that the original is better. Just having seen both of them, um, over the years repeatedly, uh, but I do appreciate the gore and the messiness of the remake. And I think uh, they really improve on what a lot of people kind of wanted out of the original that were our age that didn't get to see the original when it came out. A lot of blood, guts, gore, uh, really good stuff. Just really watched uh, for the first time Texas Chainsaw Master at the beginning, which is the prequel to the uh, remake. It's awful. I hated that movie. Couldn't stand it. Uh, just... I don't know what I mean, people hated it. So I, to me, it's the worst one. I, I don't understand why that one was made. I don't get it. They really, which one is that? The it's beginning? called uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning. So it's the, it's the prequel to this, to the remake. And it's got Jordana Brewster in it. Um, they really like the beginning, the beginning I'm putting in quotes. They really don't give you much of a backstory, except that someone calls him the R word. And then he turns into a mass murderer. That's all it takes. So it it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I at the end of it, I was just kind of angry with it. I was like, what the fuck did I just watch? Um, Is it worse than Texas Chainsaw 3D? Yeah, I see. Okay, here we're getting to this one. I actually really like Texas Chainsaw 3D. People hate this movie. And it sounds like you're one of them. And that's okay. But this movie was so different than what I was expecting. It was gory, which I liked. Um, but the whole familia uh, aspect to it where it, 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 she ends up being, she's the daughter, the, the baby. Um, and the fact that uh, like, it almost like posits like Leatherface has actually just kind of been wronged. I actually liked that aspect of it. And I know someone, Dave Buss, if you're out there listening, I know he was also a huge fan of it. Like I was, 
Um, there's there's not many of us because uh, it is very much universally hated. But I did like it. I don't know what it was. I just watched it again this week. Um, I still like it. it you know, it, it does that not hurt that Alexandra Daddario is in the film. But that's not the reason I like it. I, I like it because they decided they dared to be different. And in in this type of uh, franchise, I think that was something I could get behind. Um, Interesting. I did not see this one because I am not a fan of just the 3D. I don't like it. It messes with my head. And I always leave the theater with a headache. So I don't know. It's an ice thing or a perception thing. I just, yeah. So no, I, I did not watch it. All things 3D. I did not watch it in 3D. So you can watch it in 2D. Um, it is on Netflix. It'll be on Netflix March 1st. Then they made Leatherface, which ended up being a straight to VOD movie. Um, I, I liked that one for the most part. That is a true like prequel. Um, it goes back like, uh, like when he was a, uh, like a teenager essentially. So that one takes the idea that, okay, like this is something he gets, he gets this, he wasn't born with the scar on his face. He gets it while he's a teenager. And then he ends up just becoming like, uh, mur- he's already in like a psych ward and that one is interesting at least to the point where you don't really know who Leatherface is until the end of the movie because there's like three kids that kind of fit the description and they all run away from the place together so then you're kind of trying to figure out who it is which I thought that was an interesting premise um, not completely well executed but it, it's okay all right, so uh, this this year we get Fetty Alvarez produced, uh, directed by David Blue Garcia, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, twenty twenty two. If you want to call it that, um, it stars Sarah Yarkin, Elsie Fisher, Mark Burnham as the new Leatherface, uh, Jacob Lattimore, Mo Dunford plays Richter, Olin. F- Furo plays uh, Sally Hardesty. Uh, Sally Hardesty was an original, a legacy character is what they've grown to call them now. Um, so she is the f- original survivor from the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now the actress is different, different person, uh, but they went like kind of like um, copying how the new Halloween sequels. So that's the vibe that I got from it too. Like I was like, oh, I, okay, was, so this yeah. is what we're doing. And that was one of those things I think a lot of people, that's one, definitely one thing I think a lot of people felt that they didn't need to be in it. And I kind of agree with that as they didn't do much with her. Um, but as the movie goes as a whole, so we, we get to uh, Har- Harlow, Harlow, Texas, I think is where it takes place. And that was another issue right. with people is it doesn't take place in the same area that the original takes place in. Um, this, I don't know. Understand why? Because they explain that you know he's on the run and he's wears right. a mask. Exactly. Well, the story is a bunch of um, influencers are on their way to the small town that these two other like internet chefs purchased, and they're going to sell off all the properties and kind of turn it into the, their own hipster village type thing. That's the problem. I really like the fact that they made these four in the car not super likable. Or really judgmental yeah. and kind of just... You kind of had to wait. I mean, for the two main ones, you kind of had to wait till the end of the movie before you really felt anything for them. Because early on, you're kind of like, wait, what's going on here? Um, yeah. My my sentiment was, oh, good. You deserve to get chainsawed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, especially- I'm just saying, while they're not wrong in their assessment, deliberately poking the bear when the gentleman holding the gun at the gas station has not done a single fucking thing to you yet. Exactly. Like, exactly. You know, well, there's no reason to be a dick just to be a dick. Yes. Granted your assumptions of who the person is may be accurate. Why, why choose violence basically? <laughs> and you know, honestly I was sitting, all right, I'm going to go divert just a little bit here. I was sitting in church thinking about this movie. Yeah, a great comparison to think about when wow. you're in church. Right? <laughs> You know, a lot of people, you know, well, you know, pseudo Christians are kind of like, oh, well, you do that. Oh, you must be a terrible person. Yes. Uh, not like me who is sitting in church on Sunday morning. Don't look at all the stuff I've done during the week, but <laughs> I'm here now. So I'm better than you. You know, anyway, that's the comparison of how church and Texas Chainsaw Massacre mesh together in Wayne's head. <laughs> nice. Um, 
Yes. So as you said, when they meet uh, Richter at the gas station where the, the one sister comments on his gun because um, we come to find out that the one other sister survived a school shooting. Uh, so I think that has a lot to the, the main reason to why why that was a, a topic of conversation. Um, and then you come to find out that he's not really a terrible person. So, you know, like he's he's a nice enough man um, who does some good things later in the film. Uh, so they go there and like you said, you know, you already mentioned poking the beast and they kind of do something similar. The uh, the main character played by um, Jacob Lattimore, he plays uh, Dante and he is under the impression that his company or whoever, I wasn't sure if he was the one that they never really clarified how famous these two chefs were. Were they just like internet famous or would they have like their own reality show? Like we didn't really get an indication of that. Um, so I don't know like if he would have purchased them or if he had like his agent purchased the properties or whatever. They're under the impression that they own the house that this old lady is in and her son lives with her. And so the uh, they go into this house. They find out she's there. They go into the house and then they're like, OK, man, well, you have to go like we own this property. And. Uh, she ends up like having an attack. The cops come in and they remove her and they're taking her to the hospital. Uh, the one, the girlfriend, Dante's girlfriend uh, gets in the car, uh, Ruth, and she goes with him to the hospital and the old lady dies. Well, if you already haven't figured out her son that was with her is Leatherface. And he's obviously very upset that his mother has just died and he's got someone to blame. And it's the people that had her removed from her house. And this is where the uh, massacre part of Texas Chainsaw Massacre film comes into play. Um, some of my favorite comments on Twitter were like, people were like, wow, we actually have an actual Chainsaw Massacre in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre film. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, he kills him in several different ways. But there is a scene where he gets to use, he uses the chainsaw on basically just about everybody that he murders in that one scene. Uh, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so then begins the rampage. And you, um, the one uh, sister played by uh, Sarah Yarkin, uh, Melody, she starts to feel guilty. You know, she's real feels pretty guilty about what they did to that old woman, and especially if they didn't own the property. So then they go to into the house to look for the deed um, after Richter takes their keys away because he's like, you got to prove you own that place so that you had a right to kick that woman out, which makes sense. Uh, they go to look for the deed, and they do find the deed, but then that's when Leatherface has returned to the house after he killed everybody in the van and uh, begins his massacre of that small town and all the uh, hipster influencers that are there to purchase said town. Um, that's all the description I'll give. I don't want to spoil anything. I I like this movie. I did. I, I really had a good time with it. Um, I thought the deaths were really good. Lots of good gore. Um, I it, the two sisters. I ended up really liking them by the end of the film. Um, I think what you know what we get when it, it's one of those films that actually has. It's a horror film that actually I think has somewhat character development, and I think it's okay not to like them in the beginning of the movie because you're just getting to know them. And the, the two that, you know, end up making it through most of the film, uh, I think are good people and you do get to see that out of them. Um, and there, I mean, there, there's some killer moments, some killer action sequences towards the end of the film, some killer violence some killer, uh, just effects and stuff like that. Um, I, yeah, I just, I really had a good time with this film. I don't know what your feelings are about it, but I, I did enjoy it a lot. Um, and I think uh, it was a worthy uh, addition to the franchise. Definitely. Yeah. The kills were fantastic. I just, oh, the gore was strong in this one. It Yes, it was. It, um, it really like just makes you go. There are a lot of moments where I was just like, oh, oh, ah, oh, God. Um, I will give away the first kill. I want to give away the first kill because I think it was really good. And I told my wife because she was she was like doing her hair or whatever, and, and the, the so I'm like, you don't care if I start this to you. She's like, no, whatever. I don't want to watch it. So, but I told her when she came back, I'm like, you just missed Leatherface. He broke this guy's hand in half, and then he took his hand and he stabbed him to death with it. <laughs> I was like, I'm like that was amazing. 
Um, and it was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> there's just so there are so many like cool moments like that in this film. Um, I think you know people have been chasing the two highs in this franchise. The high of the original film being kind of like this classic uh, horror film that's not really that gr- um, graphic, but is it has you know spends a lot of time on the, the character, the bad characters, and the family. And then you have the fans of the um, of the remake, the same thing. Like the family is important, and I think the family missing is what a lot of people were upset about in this one. And I get that because. Leatherface is always about his family. They're always around helping him and stuff like that. Um, But I think we're getting that. I think this was just a nice setup of where he's been for the next, for the last 50 years. And then if they do any more sequels, I think maybe we will get more family members and stuff like that, that kind of come into play. Um, As there, if if you do watch this, there is an end credit scene. Go, you just fast forward to the end on Netflix. Um, It's nothing major, but Reminded me of the end of the Rambo movie uh, where he comes home finally. Uh, so that, I guess, just kind of gave it away. Um, but uh, I do think that the Sally Hardesty um, plot was a bit of a reach. And like we talked about, they were definitely, uh, we got very much Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills vibes out of that one, trying to make her um, uh, Lori Strode. And she is now Lori Strode. Uh, they don't give her a lot to do. Uh, it's just, yeah, it was, that was, I think, a misstep, one of the missteps of the film. Other than that, I, I mean, there's not a lot to hate about it. I mean, I'd give it like a seven, seven and a half out of 10 uh, on a just pure enjoyment level. Um, it's a real quick watch too. It's only 83 minutes in total and 73 minutes of that is the actual movie. The rest of it is the credits and the end credit scene. So um it's a quick watch. I'm definitely going to revisit this. I think at some point when I, you know, do another, maybe another rewatch of the whole franchise again. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I like it. I liked it. it. If you're on horror Twitter, you'll know that there's a big divide of people that loved it and people that hated it. Um, it's not perfect, but it's definitely a solid film. I think Wayne, what, what would your rating be of it? Yeah, it's a solid seven. Yeah. Any more final thoughts on it? I'm really interested to see where they're going to go, if they're going to continue or do something more with this. Because, you know, I think it deserves it. It it it, it should it definitely at least be in consideration for another, yeah, iteration or sequel or whatever you want to call it. I haven't seen the numbers yet, but a lot of it will be based on because Netflix has the benefit of they don't have to ca- they don't care what reviewers think. They base it on views. So if this breaks any sort of views viewing uh ship viewership that they're looking for then they'll probably make another one. Um, It it was not necessarily, it was not made by Netflix. It was made by Legendary, who normally releases their movies with Warner Brothers. It was then sold to Netflix. Um, Mm -hmm. So it would then definitely have to be a, you know, a a Legendary Netflix combo deal probably to make this thing work again, because Legendary obviously isn't going to make really any, the only money they made off of it was selling it to Netflix. So, um, but I I do implore you, if you are a horror fan, even if you're not a big fan of this franchise or you think you're not going to like it, go and watch it. Because the more people that go and watch these streaming movies, the better chance we have of something like this getting made and put on a streaming service or just put in theaters or wherever. Because it viewers matter. And this type of movie... Uh, horror movies in general need people to watch them in order for them to keep getting made. Even the bad ones. It doesn't matter if they're good or bad. You want more movies to get made so you can discover the gems that come out of that. They're only going to make them if people watch them. So go and watch it on Netflix. It's only an hour and, and what, 20 minutes of your time? Less than? Yep. Um, definitely, you know, and then if you hate it, leave your opinion. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely, I think something people need to be um, aware of that if you want this kind of stuff to get made and other sequels and original ideas and stuff, you have to kind of participate in the viewing of them for people to, to want to make them because that's Netflix bases everything on what people watch, um, what they're going to, they're going to get, they don't have like a huge, they don't have like a big rating system. Like, you know, everybody else has, and they don't base it on reviews and stuff because there's some really shitty movies on Netflix that got sequels and it's because people watch them. Um, and that's all it takes. So if you like stuff like this, just go on and watch it. That's all I'm going to say on that. 
Um, next, we're going to move to we're going to move to our next film, Wayne. And uh, I definitely did not expect to have the reaction I had to this movie that I did. Uh, this is the brand new uh, The Kingsman, which came out at the end of last year in theaters. And then it was released to Hulu and HBO Max uh, last week. Stars Ray Fiennes, Gemma Arterton, uh, Reese Ifans, Harris Dickinson, Jaman Hansu. Um, let's see. Matthew Good, Charles Dance. Uh, Daniel Bruhl is in it as well. Um, oh, and uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Directed by Matthew Vaughn. Written by Vaughn. Um, Carl Gadushik. Mark Miller is based on his his comic book, The Secret Service. Um, it is the prequel to Kingsman, The Secret Service, and Kingsman, The Golden Circle. It takes place during like World War II times. It's basically about the beginning. Of, actually, I guess it's pre-World War II times, but it's about the beginning of the Kingsman agency. Um, it starts off with the death of Ray Fiennes' wife in front of their son. And that mm -hmm. kind of sculpts the whole film, I guess, in a way. Um, as he's basically all about protecting his child since he lost his, you know, the love of his life. Uh, but beneath the surface, there's, you know, he pretends to be very much a pacifist, which he is. But he is also, you know, helping uh, him and his friends are helping fight wars and stuff like that ray finds character and his son just kind of wants to be involved he wants to go serve in the military and and you know his dad help hopes that once he introduces him to the kingsman agency that he'll not want to do that but of course if you've seen the movie you know that's not the case um i did not like this movie wayne i, I am right there with you i was incredibly disappointed i it was boring yes I didn't care about the the story. Uh, the plot really didn't matter to me. The um, twist midway through was just kind of like, eh. The, the twist, yeah, what did they, and I just kind of spoiled that for you. The twist is that he's already got the Kingsman agency up. I knew who the villain was early on because I was sitting there. Because So the villain people is somebody that you see through the movie, but they're doing a Scottish accent. And I'm someone who watches a lot of movies. And I'm like, I know that. I know that voice. I've heard that Scottish accent before. And mm -hmm. I can't remember if he's done it in a movie before. He may not have. I just knew his inflection. So I knew, who, I'm not going to say who it is because in, in case you want to know. I went to IMDb to look to see who it might be. And then I, that's where it spoiled me that it was this other character playing. And I was like, oh, okay. I, I'm like, I knew I recognized the voice. It was him. So that like whole reveal at the end was nothing to me. Um, the action sequences are very few and far between. There, there are not enough action sequences in a in a in a franchise Kingsman movie, especially. Yeah, a franchise that hinders on them. Um, it's not fun. It, they really there were a couple. I had a couple chuckles here and there, um, but it really it just I was wholly disappointed. It seemed to go on forever. It didn't yes. help that I had to keep stopping it and whatnot, but... Uh, as much as I loved the first one, the second one was, you know, albeit a disappointment as well, but this one was just like, really? Uh, At least Golden Circle was fun. This yeah. was just like, hey, you want to be depressed for two hours and 17 minutes, and, or two hours and 11 minutes, and not see a lot of action sequences? Did you stay around for the post credit scene? I did, which I... Oh, my God. <sighs> which... Didn't make much sense to me because of nope. who it is and like, hold on, what what time period is this? Right. So that so, was confusing as well. Right. Exactly. Because I, I thought it was, I thought it was supposed to be pre World War Two. Maybe it was pre World War One. Like I don't, I don't know. It was because they introduced him as like a character like that no one's supposed to have ever heard of before. Right. But even though he did, he didn't take over. Well, spoiler: it's Hitler. Um, even though he didn't really take over until World War II, Hitler was around during World War One, and he kind of started becoming a figure after World War One. Okay, the person that's assassinated is Archduke Franz Ferdinand. That starts World War One. Oh, so okay, that's why it does fit. Okay, so, so that's maybe maybe there. Okay, so then I guess you could say there are people that didn't know who Hitler was. 
Um, yeah. But it, it, it seemed like such like a, like you were supposed to feel shocked when they reveal it that I was so just pissed off. I was like, what? Like, this is your big reveal. I'm like, wow. So like, I did not care. I did not care for the end credit scene. I did just the, everything this movie could do to make me angry was it did. And like, I had started watching it before Donovan and I went to the store. So in the first 28 minutes, I was like, I'm not really digging this, but maybe, maybe I'll come back and the rest of the movie will fly by and it'll be like this huge action. Nope. It just, it gets more boring. And by the time they ramp up the action, it's like, I don't care anymore. Just end this. Then that was basically what happened is, but you're right. That's exactly the best way to describe it. The last action sequence is fine. Like it, it does, but like, I just didn't, you're right. I just don't, you don't care by the end of the movie that you're just like, whatever. All right, man. Like he, he found his way to killing people again. I guess that's what we're, so like pacifism is bad. Like, is that what we're supposed to learn from this movie? Um, it, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I like Matthew Vaughn. I've liked most of his movies. I just, this was a huge misstep and I see what they're trying to do is similar what they, what they're doing with the Yellowstone franchise at Paramount is they're, you know, creating stories years in the past that they don't have to worry about meshing with the future. And that's what the Kingsman did. It was like, let's do a story like way before any of this began. So we don't have to worry about tying in other characters. They did uh, show you the reason why they come up with um, the names for uh, Merlin and Lancelot, the whole, the King Arthur names and all that stuff. So there is that in there. That's like the only tie in though, to the, the original films. Um, Cause I thought maybe it was going to be like world war two. So they could have younger versions of some of those characters, but they can't in world war one. There's no way. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it just, it, this is a true disappointment. Like I, this, I don't want like I wanted to like this movie. I really did. I just couldn't get into it. I, it was the the pacing was bad. The the um, I just don't care. I didn't care about the story. The only person I really liked was Gemma Arterton, who's barely in the fucking movie, which pissed me off even more because she's mm-hmm. your main female character and you hardly ever see her. Um, and it sets up like, oh, okay, maybe if they do a sequel, she'll be. Bit. I don't want a sequel. Do a yeah, sequel no. to the second movie uh, or do a, a prequel, a young Harry Hart prequel. I thought that that would have been cool. Yes, um, that, that, that nice. But I think as much as I hate to say, it, I think Kingsman just needs to stop. I do. I agree. I think we've, I mean, the only thing it did was it made me go, man, I really need to watch the first one again. <laughs> like, yes, kind of absolutely. The only moment I had throughout the movie, it was like, Man, remember that? Like in my whole head, I'm like, remember that scene in the church? Remember that other scene? Remember that other scene? Like that's all my head. Oh, was come on, where's the bar scene? Yeah, <laughs> it, you know what I mean. Like, even, is- they tried to like, you know, manners maketh the man. Yeah, and when they delivered the line, I'm like, shut up. Well, because it was so it was so late in the movie, and like yeah. it was like no one had ever said it before until that moment. Like you, it should have been like like his motto or something. It and it didn't have things. any impact. It was just said. Yeah, he was like, you know, like they say, manners maketh the man. I'm like, what? Are you fucking kidding me? Um, I did like Resiphons as Rasputin. Yes, um, that was one of the. That was probably the high point. And then and that whole thing. Movie probably... much. So like, <laughs> I assumed he was the main villain. I was wrong. Yeah. Um, and. Everybody, all the other villains in comparison were a huge letdown. Yes, so. exactly. Especially because you don't get the reveal of who the main villain is until the last five minutes of the movie. So the impact mm-hmm. of him being the villain really doesn't matter at that point. Justice for goats. Mm. I did. Okay. I did like when the goat got his revenge though. Yep. So that was, that was a good part. But then when he's jumping on the goats, that was weird. Yep. Um, yeah, just everything about this movie just didn't make sense to me. I, and why they made it in the first place, I have no idea. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Three out of ten, Wayne. <laughs> I really, honestly, when this movie was over, I was like, I hated that. And I don't hate a lot of movies. I, I did not like it. I did not enjoy myself watching this movie. So maybe a three out of ten is even being a bit generous. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't the worst. It, it looked fine. It was pretty, but... 
I guess story you know, wise, yes, it it was a movie that was well made in the sense that it looked good, but it wasn't. There well weren't made. any gaffes in editing or anything like that. Yeah. So yeah, three I, is a good score. Yeah, so like a three out of ten, I think works for that respect. Is giving credit to the people behind the scenes that made this movie and tried to make a movie that looked good. It just and maybe it's just because I was so disappointed in it because I was expecting to like it. Um, yeah, I just didn't care for it. So I, my opinion, don't watch it. Unless you are a completist and you got to watch the whole franchise, I, yeah. Don't no, just have the affection for the first two. Yeah, and I'm going to try and rewatch the first one just to get my <laughs> excitement for it back. Get your mind right. <laughs> um. All right. So, Wayne, you got anything you want to talk about that you watched this week? Look at my letterbox. No, I, I'm going to jump into both uh, Ozarks this week, and uh, I need to do uh, season two of The Witcher, which I have not done yet. So yeah, I haven't watched it starting both of those. Nice. All right, so um, let's see. I watched Texas Chainsaw the beginning this week. As I said, that was terrible. Uh, I watched the Tall Girl movies. Those are two movies I would say on Netflix that aren't very good, but they're under. If you like the kind of like rom coms that Netflix has, they're okay. Black Bear with Aubrey Plaza. I watched that one. That was her movie from 2020. She's fantastic in it. It's Unfortunately, it's not a movie for everybody. I thought it was really good and really well made, but it's going to be one of those movies that people watch and they're going to be like, ah, fuck this movie. Um, but if you're into just kind of like art house indie films, definitely check it out. Um, we watched The Mauritanian, which is the uh, terrorist movie that Jodie Foster made a couple years ago about 9-11, where she's uh, a true story that she's defending one of the people being held at Guantanamo Bay. Um, really good. Uh, Tahar Rahim is the main actor. My wife is now infatuated with him, so we've watched basically everything that we could find him in. Um, that was actually the th- second thing we watched him in. There was something else that he was in that she was like, oh, I like this guy. We should watch more of this stuff. So I started watching uh, Parks and Rec again. I'm trying to give it another chance because I, I really want to try to watch everything Aubrey Plaza has made because I like her a lot. Um, as an actress. So that's just kind of where I'm at right now. Um, other than that, I got not much else. Uh, if you got Letterboxd, I am on there. So every movie I watch, even if I don't post it on Instagram right away, I review it right away uh, just to keep better track of what I watched. Um, so yeah, you can find me on there if you're if you're on there. All right. Um, news this week. End of Watch TV series happening at Fox. Director David Iyer wrote the first script. Frank Grillo to star in Stephen C. Miller werewolf film called Year Two. Danielle Pineda joins the cast of the anthology series Tales of the Walking Dead. She was from uh, Jurassic uh, World Fallen Kingdom. DC making Wonder Twins film with Black Adam Ryder. Amy Schumer, Regina Hall, and Wanda Sykes are going to host the Oscars this year. Like I talked about last week, they're going to do each host is going to get an hour, I believe, is how they're going to separate it. Um, so, yeah, that'll be interesting. And I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but with the Oscars, you know, they did not take a lot of risks this year. So I understand people being upset at that aspect of the Oscars. I do wish that they would take more risks each year and nominate kind of weird films that maybe people aren't going to notice or remember uh, if they haven't seen it. You know, so it's like something that, that I think they should draw bring attention to. They did announce a uh, fan voted Oscar for best movie and best moment fan voted Oscar announced. So they're trying to get more fan participation into this. So if you like, if you like Spider-Man, you can go on, you can vote for Spider-Man. Unfortunately, I was say, is it Spider-Man? Yeah. Tell me it's Spider-Man. Unfortunately for the internet, uh, the internet's going to win on this right now. It's the Cinderella Amazon prime original film. Uh, everyone's like i hope you can sense my glare right now yes i can't everyone is like who asked for this like this was this is a, the unfortunate part of what you're gonna get when you allow fan voting sometimes you know if you're a fan of american idol just think of that one person who you thought was amazing and they all they just got voted off because everyone was being a dick that day or something like that that's what this is got the sense hopefully it balances out and it's actually a movie that the audience liked but right now it's that. So I, I haven't seen it, so I can't say it's a, it's not supposed to be a, a bad movie, I don't think. But it's not one that like a lot of people talked about. So if that would were to win it, it would just be kind of strange. Netflix announces Bioshock film, glorious uh, rest stop bathroom horror film to star J.K. Simmons and Ryan Quan. 
Terrence Howard and Cuba Gooding Jr. will star in Skeletons in My Closet. It's a film inspired by the Latino myth La Lorna, which we've seen a bunch of movies out uh, lately. The one called La Lorna, which is on Shudder, is fantastic, and I highly recommend it. Jack Quaid, latest to join Nolan's Oppenheimer biopic. Chris Pine and the crew in talks for a new Star Trek film being released December 22nd, 2023. Paramount Plus has ordered 1932, a new part of the Dutton history. So if you watch Yellowstone, there's 1883, which is basically about the beginning of the Dutton Ranch, which is, um, uh, what's his name? Tim McGraw and Faith Hill are in it. And Sam Elliott, Tim McGraw plays uh, like the great, great, great grandfather of of Kevin Costner's character, maybe just two greats. And he, uh, they're on their way to like uh, eventually probably start building the Yellowstone Ranch. Uh, so 1932 will take place at another time at the uh, Yellowstone. Teen Wolf TV show revival film coming to Paramount+. Plus. Full cast will not be in it. John Krasinski announces A Quiet Place 3 for 2025. How I Met Your Father has been renewed for a second season at Hulu. Peacemaker renewed for second season at HBO Max. Rupert Grint and Nikki Amuko Bird cast in the new M. Night film. Ray Liotta joins Demi Moore and Margaret Qualley in body horror film The Substance. Chris and Paul White's making a film called Spanish Dracula. It's a film about a Spanish actress, Lupita Tovar, who was their grandmother. She appeared in Universal Spanish version of Dracula in 1931 and kind of made a career out of being in the Spanish versions of Hollywood films. Uh, John Cena will star in Looney Tunes film Coyote vs. Acme, a live-action CG hybrid film. Halo already renewed for a second season before season one even airs. Rennie Harlan directing horror film Carrier starring Kate Bosworth, Ron Perlman, and Lynn Shea. New TMNT film to get Paramount Plus sequel films based on popular villains in the franchise. That's the Seth Rogen animated film that's coming out. will then have Paramount Plus original films based on some of their villains. Uh, so they're trying to turn that obviously into a huge uh, franchise. Super Pumped, uh, which is the new show on Showtime with Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Uma Thurman that's based on the creator, I believe it's the creator of Uber right now, is getting a second season which will focus on Facebook. Carrie Russell heading to Netflix with political TV show The Diplomat. Stranger Things to come to an end with season five. Um, that's disappointing. It sucks. But we get two season, two parts for part four, or for season four, and then next year we'll get season five. So we at least still have two more years of it. Um, I love that show. I can't wait for season four. If that feels like it's about good, though, like it's, you know, we got, yes, a, lot, we got the, a lot to look forward to, but let's not beat the dead horse. Yeah, so this is, I believe, about four or five seasons is where they wanted to go out. So it's, it's fitting to what they wanted to do. History of Evil will see Stephanie Beatrice and Paul Wesley star together in a new horror film for Shudder. Caroline Williams from Texas Chainsaw Two and Ten Minutes to Midnight, which we reviewed on this podcast. Joins Renfield starring uh, Nicholas Holt and Nicholas Cage. So that's a big movie that she's going to be in. We're happy for her for that. Uh, Megan Thee Stallion to star in Parent Trap like R rated musical called Fucking Identical Twins. Uh, Nathan Lane, Megan Mullally, and Bowen Yang from SNL are also in the cast. Atlanta will end after season four. So this year will be season three. At some time in the future, we'll get season four. I can't, with Donald Glover's schedule, you can never guarantee it'll be next year. Uh, the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel renewed for a fifth and final season. Fargo renewed for a fifth season. Benson and Moorhead, the directors who I've talked about before, I love all their films, and they directed the episodes of Moon Knight coming up in March, have been hired to direct uh, the season two episodes of Loki. Uh, Walton Goggins cast as the lead in the Amazon Prime uh, Fallout uh, video game adaptation series. Olivia Munn also joins the cast of Tales from the Walking Dead. Release is coming up. Deep Water with Anna Diarmas and Ben Affleck is going straight to Hulu on March 18th. That was a big, supposed to be a big movie because they were dating at the time and all that, and it's just getting dumped to Hulu. Chippendale Rescue Rangers with John Mulaney and Andy Samberg hits Disney Plus May 20th. That's a new feature film. Windfall hits Netflix March 18th. Barry Season 3 uh, starts on HBO April 24th. I'm a huge fan of Barry. If you haven't seen it, definitely watch it. Uh, Fresh with Sebastian Stan hits Hulu March 3rd. Stranger Things Season 4 Part 1 lands May 27th, and Part 2 lands July 1st. The Terminal List TV series with Chris Pratt and Taylor Kitsch hits Amazon Prime July 1st. Hustle with Adam Sandler hits Netflix June 10th. Uh, Deaths this week, we talked about Ivan Reitman, obviously. Alfred Soule, director of Alice Sweet Alice, 
dead at 78. Frank, Pes- Frank Pesky from Top Gun, Paradise Alley, and Beverly Hills Cop, dead at 75. And Brenda Dice from Red, the new movie Red Rocket, dead at 60. Uh, that's our show for this week, everybody. Uh, Wayne, do you have any final thoughts or notes that you want to talk to anybody about? Nope. Thanks for listening, guys. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening to an all-brand-new episode of Now Showing with Mike and Wayne. All right, and the actor? Hasta la vista, baby. Hey, everybody! We're all gonna get late! Yeah!